autistic. All right, cool. This is just a little intimidating for me since uh, I'm not used to talking, uh, least of all with the PA and worst of all with an actual crowd in front of me. Um, I will warn you, uh, this presentation is probably going to be a little on the boring side because it was mostly designed with the intent and knowledge that a lot of people probably weren't going to be able to make this presentation at all. So, Wi-Fi networking done the right way or reliable links made easy? I really suck at titles. Yeah. Okay, that kind of got cut off. Um, anyway, who am I? Uh, cell phone set to stun, please. Please myself. Uh, let's just kill that. All right. Uh, worked in a small wireless ISP, course vendor trained, uh, which means we do it exactly this way or... Uh, God help us, you know, the FCC will get after you. Um, installed a small city WAN, which is a really nice way of saying that I was stupid enough to climb a ladder at my employer's insistence. Uh, been in ham radio for 12 years, which doesn't really say a whole lot, uh, but I've done a lot of uh, research in this in this matter and uh, a lot of antenna uh, research and, and seen some really interesting things. And, of course, infrastructure geek, which is actually one of the things that's cut off at the bottom. Um, I'm willing to bet that's not quite set up correctly. Okay. Here's the assumptions. Uh, let me see if I can fix this somewhat better. I guess I'll just have to deal with the being cut off there. Um, the assumptions, of course, are that you want to set up reliable links. You want this stuff to, to work where you can push traffic over it, you know, as reliably as possible, backbone links, that sort of stuff. Uh, the other assumption is you have a I basic idea, more or less, of, of how radio works. You know, you put an antenna up here, you put an antenna up there. Magically, things just sort of happen. Um, Wi-Fi is, in fact, radio, if you were not aware of that. Uh, and, of course, down here at the bottom, which is cut off, you know that Wi-Fi is a former radio and how to hook them up to antennas. So, Oh, does anybody know what? Let's see. Is it in there? Okay. That's actually part that's cut off. Um, it says, do you, you know that Wi-Fi is a former radio, not PFM. Does anybody know what PFM means? Pure freaking magic. Okay. You know what antennas are, how to mount them, and point them at something. Very, very important. Um, because if you, if you just have it, if you just have it, you know, pointed off in some weird angle, expecting to talk across the street, that's just not going to cut it. Sometimes. Uh, does anybody here know what a decibel is? Okay, that's that's one answer, but a tenth of a bell is correct. Um, I've got uh, I've got another slide here, which is uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've I've got another slide here which has the uh, which explains some of the uh, what uh, what all that stuff is. Well, this is just wonderful. Um, okay, gain versus power. We have two types: antenna gain, amplifier gain. Uh, antenna gain, you obviously you improve the signal uh, directivity often greatly, which is. Uh, yeah, at 2.4 gigahertz, it's fairly easy to get a high amount of gain in a, in a physically small dish. On the lower frequencies, things don't translate quite as well, and in order to achieve the same results, you have to have really expensive hardware um, on the order of you know steel supporting structures and whatnot. Um, yeah, we, we generally, generally speaking, the, the sky is the limit, uh, but it's costly and useless beyond a certain point because you can only throw so much metal at the problem and you hit the, the point of uh, diminishing returns as it's called uh, where you you can still add metal but you just don't get anything more for it um, of course it's always advised to invest in metal not watts because usually it's cheaper to get an antenna they tend to last long they don't usually die or corrode depending on whether or not you're in Florida 
Uh, amplifier gain, of course, actually generate more signal, uh, but this gets a little interesting with the FCC because of some of the limits of rules in Part 15. Um, of course, it, it, cuts the, it cut off the bottom half of the slide. I love this thing. Um, amplifiers are a lot more expensive than antennas, mostly for Wi-Fi. Um, usually the time you start talking about using amplifiers, you're talking about running a, either a nice big piece of expensive coax up the side of a tower, or you're talking about using a cheap piece of coax and using a $300 amplifier. And, uh, you know, you just have to, to kind of gear that one for, for what you can get away with and, and, and what needs to be accomplished. And also, it, this, is, this gets a little tricky because depending on exactly what you're doing and what kind of antenna you're using, you may have to actually cut the power that you're, you're transmitting uh, in order to, to meet the FCC requirements for Part 15. Uh, yeah. Again, put your signal where you want it and sometimes make sure it's not there. Um, let's see. Down here, we've got uh, best investment for networking at 900, 2.4, 5.8 gigahertz and beyond, typically expressed in DBI or DVD. Uh, DBD is usually a term thrown around by people who have familiar familiarity with the dipole, which is a very simple antenna, and realistically, it's a standard from which all others are measured. Uh, DBI is a, the I stands for an isotropic radiator, which is basically a point source, uh, which we don't have the ability to generate. And the closest example I can give of a of a uh, an isotropic radiator is the sun because it radiates equally in all directions out from the middle. <sighs> okay, yeah, amplifiers typically cost about 300 bucks. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a ham radio license, you can actually waste a lot more money than that because you can buy, you know, amplifiers up to, you know, 100 watts because it's, it's red spectrum. That's the limit for, for hams anyway, but there's other, other issues to deal with. Um, this is probably a little dated since I think I've actually seen some 802.11g uh, amplifiers. But one of the problems is is that you have so much information in, in such a space that uh, it can be a bit trying on the amplifiers just to, to do their job at uh, using G just because of the, the bit to, the, what is it, bit to hertz ratio. Uh, the 802.11b stuff generally just does its, its job and, and works. Okay, and of course, bottom half the slide. Uh, extremely limited applications usually use amplifiers for backhaul stuff. We want it to work. We want it to be reliable um, at the expense of having a single point of failure up close to the antenna. Usually, amplifier gain is expressed in decibels, as usual, uh, and dBm, which is more a, a value of the actual output power. Uh, okay. This, this is really important. Um, EIRP and ERP, uh, effective radiated power. If the SEC decides that they want to talk to you about this stuff, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and, and find a lawyer in Washington just in case. Um, the SEC is kind of one of those weird organizations when it comes to official correspondence. You can try to wing it on your own and may be able to get away with it, but if things start going downhill, it will be expensive. Uh, the bottom line here, which is cut off, is, is that they start at $10,000 for a simple fine. Uh, unfortunately, that figure is many, many years old. They've been handing out $10,000 fines since, I think, the 60s, which, of course, meant a lot more then. But, uh, like I say, they don't like to mess around too much. Here lately, they've been pretty laissez-faire, but they used to really have some teeth. Okay, effective isotropic radiated power, EIRP, which, like I said, goes back to the whole thing about a point source versus the other. And ERP, effective radiated power, eh, somewhat interchangeable. Not exactly, kind of, sort of. It's a legal definition, uh, but mostly people use them interchangeably. Uh, EIRP is what the FCC rates everything in because they believe that this is how much, how much RF leakage you should be presenting, how much energy you're putting out there, and just polluting space in general. It's it's okay. The the question is is, is how uh, how ERP is defined with uh, 
with the directional antenna, and usually the way that's handled is, is it's simply the power that you're transmitting plus the antenna's gain. So, like I say, it doesn't change too much. It's, it's still it's an effective multiplier. Uh, if you have a TV station transmitting at 60,000 watts and they have an antenna gain of, like, I think 14 or 17 dBi, you wind up with an effective radiated power in, you know, about a megawatt or so, which is why you can pick up the TV station so well. And really, honestly, they do radiate a lot of power sometimes. Uh, antenna gain. This is a pretty big important part because as your gain goes up, the signal that you're actually transmitting becomes more and more directional. This is pretty well a constant thing. The higher the gain, the, the closer to a point, uh, to, a, to a, a flashlight beam or a laser, the laser pointer things get. The signal becomes generally very confined. And uh, when you, well, okay. The, the signal tends to resemble a donut or a torus in the case of vertical antennas or a 3D ellipse in the case of a directional antenna. The higher the gain, the flatter the pancake. Uh, if you put if you put a, a pencil on the table, and, or you, you put pancake on the table, you put a pencil in it, that kind of looks like some of these high gain verticals, uh, vertical antennas, omnis as we call them. These are of course exaggerated figures. Uh, the green line over here is supposed to be a reasonably low gain antenna, since this is a a non-specific antenna. Uh, you can probably push these figures pretty far uh, for exactly what you're looking at. Um, but this is, this is just an example of what the radiated signal might look like, or at least the, the, the coverage pattern. Um, blue, this would be your medium gain. And then, of course, the really high gain antenna, which just, you know, flattens it way out there. Okay. Larger problem with antenna gain is people tend to confuse gain with power and make very bad decisions. When I first got into wireless networking and doing this stuff for a living, one of the problems we had was is that everybody and their brother would go out and buy a 15 dBi Omni, put a half watt amplifier behind it, and just generally create a whole lot of noise in, in the 2.4 gig band. Um, the 15 dBi antenna is not recommended because what happens is you only have so much range that you can communicate on 2.4 gigahertz with reliably. And the problem is that that pancake winds up shooting out past your users right into the horizon in a space where you can't get a signal back from. So you wind up sending your power out there, but you can't use anything coming back. It's just, it just pollutes. So it's often recommended just to use an 8 dBi and, or to, depending on exactly what your situation was, to kind of confine that in, in different ways and, and make a more effective use of, of what limited range you have for communications. Okay. Down tilt. Either mechanical or electrical. Uh, when you down tilt, basically it, the antenna is electrically a little bit shorter and forces the main lobe of radiation downward, uh, particularly when you're running, if you're up a 300-foot tower or something. You, you see this all the time in the cell phone towers. If you ever drive by one, if you can get a good look at them, you'll probably find out the antennas are, are slightly tilted. The reason for that is because they want to put the signal where it's needed and not point it into another cell where they may be using the, the channel or one of their uh, their competitors may be using the channel. It you know, benefits everybody just to, to do it right the first time. Um, yeah. Okay, the other thing is there is up tilt, which is very, very seldom used. But if you were shooting from, say, a valley up a mountain slope, you might use up tilt. But there's, there's other considerations. Uh, if you did something like that, knife edge diffraction could affect the signal and cause it to go over the other side of the mountain. It would not be very reliable on the other side, but it could be possible to pick it up from time to time. <coughs> this is an example of mechanical down tilt. Um, you can't see the bottom half of this, but there's not really much to see but what you see there, which is, uh, this is actually a border blaster. There's, uh, it's a, a radio station in San Diego, or not in San Diego, it's actually over the border in Mexico. And what they've done is, is that they're, they're transmitting power right on the border and pointing it towards San Diego and making advertising money off of it. Since it's Mexican, you know, they don't have to meet as many rules as we do. Um, like I said, this is actually a treaty violation. They've, they've sent paperwork back and forth between the states uh, to try and figure it out. And so far, nobody's found a good solution. <coughs> they've got about a 60-kilowatt transmitter feeding this thing, which is 
pretty typical for for FM. Uh, but what you can't see here is, is these nice little lines along the back, which are, are probably imperceivable to you, uh, are actually called parasitic reflectors. Uh, they're basically bouncing the entire signal north. And as a matter of fact, if they did not tilt this antenna, you could hear it in Los Angeles. Here's, well, okay, that's useful. Um, this is with known down tilt. You wind up with... Uh, the other half pretty much looks identical. It's just flat. It's confined. It goes in, in one direction. When you throw down tilt on it, you push the signal down, like I said, if you're, if you're doing coverage into valleys, things like that. Um, this is not really useful either, exactly. But you can see here, with the, this is an antenna plot. And with 10 degrees of down tilt, you have uh, zero, excuse me, you have zero here in the middle. And uh, you can see that the, the main lobe of radiation is significantly lower, whereas without down tilt, it just extends out. Uh, what's interesting to note here is, is that these, this is, I think, a 10 dBi or an 8 dBi antenna, and there is some radiation down here at the bottom. It's also possible uh, when using these antennas to create a cone of silence directly below the antenna because of the, the field that it can operate in. If it has no radiation, if it has no radiation pattern directly below it, uh, then you won't hear anything. In fact, with this antenna, you're liable to pick something up, and then at some point you'll fall into this null here, which is an uh, area of no signal, and uh, it'll you'll fall out, and then you start picking it up as you get further away again. Loss and attenuation, very important stuff. This is actually one of the really big rules as to why things are the way they are. Uh, you've got loss in virtually every device, uh, including amplifiers. Uh, most of what you're concerned about is insertion loss. Any device you insert in the RF path causes loss. Uh, again, most of what we're concerned with is path loss, which is how we get from point A to point B through the air. They have some really nice software to figure this out called path loss. And I don't remember what we paid for it years ago, but I think it was like somewhere between $500 and $2,000. So it's, it's really nice. It figures most of this stuff out for you, but it's always nice to have the, the, the grounding here to work from. <clears throat> yeah, but hey, uh, why pay for software? You can do most of the legwork yourself. Uh, magic numbers here. Um, of course, this is kind of cut off. Uh, loss in decibels, uh, 96.6 plus 20 log frequency in gigahertz and 20 log distance in miles. Okay. We have, let's say, 2483 megahertz, 3.483 gigahertz. The reason why you figure your loss is, is that the higher the frequency you operate at, the highest one's going to experience the most loss. You engineer the link for that, and your lower frequency should be fine. So, of course, it's missing the bottom half, which I'm really getting to enjoy, but that's where all the numbers are. And you wind up with 96.6 plus uh, 78995 plus... 2602 yeah, for 135, or excuse me, for 130.5 dB loss for 20 miles. dB is logarithmic measure, so the further you go, things don't necessarily get so bad. You know, uh, going a few more miles may wind up just being uh, 3 dB or so. Okay, total margin. The total margin you've got to let work with here is your transmit power minus your coax losses plus the antenna gain minus the path loss plus the antenna gain on the other side minus your coax loss. So when you're running an amplifier, when you're running a half watt amplifier, transmit power is usually going to be plus 36. It's a half a watt, plus 36 dBm. You throw in about uh, a dB or so worth of loss, and the actual figures may be lower. Uh, but usually one is a, is a good number to start with. Uh, and then plus 23, which is the, one of the most common Wi-Fi antennas out there that I'm aware of, uh, very popular, is the 23 dBi conifer, which was actually bought by Andrew, which is a 2-foot by 3-foot parabolic dish. Okay. Minus the path loss, plus another conifer on the other side, some miscellaneous loss. Most of your amplifiers actually have pre-amplifiers in them which is very useful. Like I said, you can get away with running a cheap piece of coax. Well, it's still expen it's still it's good stuff, but it's 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 cheap compared to his hard line. And uh, 
you can throw that that RX preamplifier into it, which give, basically can get you over the loss that you'd see in the cable, and then uh, some coax loss there, and you receive sensitivity. Um, receive sensitivity is a big a big part of this too. Uh, you can't receive a signal uh, below your sensitivity. So if your figure comes, if you, you're set for negative 87 here, uh, that's what the you know the Orinoco spec says that you you know you can't receive like 11 megahertz or 11 11 megabits below 87 or so and you wind up working a path loss and it shows you your signal being about like 114 db you're not going to pick it up okay all these funny numbers add up together to a margin of 47 db uh five nines reliability uh 99.999 percent is 30 dB fade margin, roughly. Uh, this particular link is 17 dB above that, so it's it's a, a pretty reliable link, assuming you don't have FAA radar and, and other issues that, that could affect it. You always do have outside influences when doing this stuff. There's, there's you know, little that can be done to control that exactly, but uh, assuming everything else, assuming you don't have any outside sources of interference, this link will be reliable. Passive repeaters. This is a really, this is a, a, a sore point for me because I hear about it so much. I've worked numbers on this before and discovered it's a really great way just to waste money. Um, passive repeaters are seldom used because they experience twice the path loss. You have the path between antenna A and antenna B, and then the path between antenna C and antenna D. And because you're working with such limited capture area, it's not able to recover enough power to always overcome the uh, loss at the other end. As you can see here, 36 dBm plus a, a 23 dBi dish minus 130 dB with the path loss. Another antenna, another loss, uh, another antenna, another 20 mile link, uh, another 23 dBi dish, 14 dBi or 14 dB worth of preamp gain, a couple of dB worth of coax loss, 150 dBm. So Really, the only time that you can use a passive repeater is if you happen to have one end extremely close and you can stay in the near field effects. And like I say, you know, you're talking about perhaps from the ground floor here, maybe the top of the uh, the building would be about the only distance you could you could reliably use it for. And even then, it could significantly impact your communications. The, uh, the comment here from this gentleman was is that uh, he's, he's heard of passive repeaters being used to get around mountains. It was actually a very common trick uh, a couple of years ago for some cable systems, but it's, uh, it's dangerous at best. It, it can work. It can be reliable, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't base a business on it. Uh, I've, I've heard of, of years in the past, you know, somebody wants to get a TV station. They live right below a mountain. they got a buddy who lives on the hill. They convince him to put up a a little pole with an antenna pointed at the TV station and then one pointed down the hill and now he can pick it up. That's, uh, you know, one of the funny things that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but for the most part in this stuff, we usually don't worry about it. Uh, of course, more points here. What we got down here is is that most cards don't work below negative 93 dBm max. And that's cutting them all the way back to half megabit if any of them still support that stuff. And like I said, not really work unless one of the links are, are really short, and it's it's not really kosher for this kind of stuff. It's just something you want to stay away from. Useless information. Don't turn your access points up unless you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you will crap all over the band and into other groups' segments of the band, which could expose you to FCC liability. And this, they're liable to take a lot more seriously than, than some of the other issues. This is a spectral plot of a clean... Uh, WAP, which you kind of miss the bottom part here, but you get the, the same basic idea. You've got this, this nice confined signal. That's 22 megahertz wide. So it's, it's still quite a signal there. The dirty WAP pretty well extends exactly in this triangle. And the problem is, is on this side of the band, you've got MMDS, which is, uh, they've got a lot of different things they can do. Some educational institutions are using that to deliver TV, but, uh, 
down in this end, you've got you know, some ham radio band, but microwave radio, it's not used all that frequently, but if you wind up living near somebody who decides they want to use it, they can really make your life a, a living hell for it. <coughs> but again, up in MMDS is where they're more liable to, if they if they see it, they're more liable to make a make a suggestion about it. Why to keep it clean? Uh, pol- good, polite engineering practice. Do it right the first time. Also has the benefit of keeping the FCC off your tail in case of a problem. Really not a good idea to mess with hams. They can transmit 100 watts with unlimited antenna gain. And you can't. MC- MMDS will just have the, the FCC sicked on you. What's really interesting about this is, is that... Uh, Ham radio does have the spread spectrum limit at 2.4 gigahertz of 100 watts, but they have to use automatic power control. Um, (coughs) However, most uh, microwave ovens actually have a magnetron in them that generates anywhere from 500 to 800 watts, about 10 megahertz wide. And um, the the FCC does allow hams to use uh, Morse code, CW, a continuous wave, and it just so happens the output of a microwave oven is generally regarded as a continuous wave. Um, now, the hams also have this interesting limit that they can only transmit a kilowatt and a half at the antenna. So if they happen to be feeding a reasonably large dish, uh, your Wi-Fi card may, lo- may no longer exist. But if it's up a tower, that's okay. If it's pointed at you, you will feel the pain. Incidentally... They'll also be liable for that, too, because you can't do that to people. <coughs> if you can turn the... Pa- it, huh? Yeah. Right. Uh, if you must turn the power up, turn it up by no more than 100%. Uh, fi- 21 milliwatts or 50 milliwatts it should should be reasonably okay. 100 milliwatts will be stretching it. The more... The problem is, is that the amplifier loses its linearity when it goes up in power. This is the same problem with CB radios. You start turning the power up, and the reason why the power goes up is because all this other energy and in, in signals other than the, the, uh, the intended signal go up, and it's all added up together in that meter. So you wind up just creating more interference. I suppose that's good if you want to keep the competition away, but it's best for everybody just to do it right the first time. 100 milliwatts, like I said, probably stretching it. OFDM, which is 802.11G, you won't be able to amp it as well as uh, as uh, CCK, which is 802.11B. Here's a nice spectral plot of 802.11G. This took a while to capture, mostly because I had to learn how to use the spectrum analyzer. This is 802.11B. You notice that they look an awful lot like each other. Now, this garbage down here is actually when the card was scanning, which they have a tendency to do in between packets. So you can see here you've got this really nice, round, uniform shape. Most of the energy off these ends just don't count. This is the 5 megahertz of division plot, which looks a lot better on my laptop screen than it does up here. Um, But you can see the same basic thing. You've got it kind of round tops there. Uh, This is rather difficult to capture. Uh... Mostly because you're talking about a signal that's there and it's gone very quickly. Uh, I think that may actually be in another talk. It's, uh, it's, uh, spread spectrum was originally known as low probability of intercept. Uh, with Wi-Fi, that's not exactly the case. <coughs> okay, Fresnel zones. Fresnel zones are a really big important thing. That's the zone where the signal resides between the two endpoints. First Fresnel zone, dot six F1 is where 60% of the signal is. For reliable links, no intrusions may be tolerated in the first Fresnel zone. Trees, rocks, houses, etc. You want to make sure whatever it is, you clear it for that Fresnel zone. And ideally, the second and third. Normally, you only really start worrying about the second and third when you're shooting over water because they have odd ways of reflecting up and canceling out the signal that you're sending. Mounting height, why is this important? For the same reason, to keep the Fresnel zone clear. Multipath is also possible. You have to kind of gauge that one carefully as to exactly how to eliminate it. That's really kind of advanced stuff. Uh, down tilt, of course, Fresnel zone location. Economics, a six-foot dish at 350 feet on a tower is a big tower, and it's also very expensive. 
But a six-foot dish at 50 feet is not going to be nearly as expensive. Realistically, anything beyond three feet, and you're probably dealing with a lot more money. Okay. Uh, the other part for no zone clearance is to maintain minimum height above the ground in accordance with the bulge created by curvature of the earth. Um, the Wi-Fi shootout, they kind of had a little problem, 125 miles. You say, wow, that's great, that's wonderful. Uh, curvature of the earth thrown in there, you wind up requiring two mountains that are 6,000 feet tall, assuming over flat land. So if there were a mountain in the middle, that link probably wouldn't happen. But if you just wanted to completely base everything flat and say, you know, like Kansas, and, and completely disregard curvature of the earth, you'd need a 6,000-foot tower on each side. So it's really crazy stuff. More math. They've got this wonderful figure. This is actually from one of Cisco's papers. Uh, everything, most of everything that's, that's in this presentation, you can pull off of the web. I've kind of done you all a favor and collated most of it. You can get like 99% of the figures that you need to figure all this stuff out. Frequencies, everything here is specified in mostly in gigahertz, megahertz. This is actually useful down to VHF. So if you want to plot a, a link, you know, at 150 megahertz between, you know, here and wherever, it, it should all translate exactly. Uh, Fresnel zone clearance. Figure comes out at 61 feet, but this is just the Fresnel zone, and there's more math. Uh, this is the uh, earth bulge figure, which is, uh, what is this? Uh, distance between the antenna squared divided by 8. Uh, which winds up being 112 feet at 30 miles. Throw it all together, and you wind up with 188 feet, which is the minimum mounting height for your antenna for this 30-mile link. Um, when you hit 200 feet, well, first of all, when you hit anything above 30 feet, you pretty well need a tower. Uh, microwave doesn't lend itself, or microwave radio, because of the antenna gain, they don't really like uh, antennas moving all that much. And when you start dealing with anything above 32 feet, you've got fall hazards. Plus, at 200 feet, you have to lamp and light a tower uh, and register it with the FCC and the FAA. So 198 feet or so is probably the highest you'd want to have anything mounted. And uh, I have a friend of mine who owns a 180-foot tower and only has a 10-foot pole on top of it just to stay under. Okay. Tower trivia, 200 feet and up, got to register and lighter paint your tower. If you use strobes, you don't have to paint your tower, but they run 24-7. If you use red lights, you do have to paint. And, of course, you still have to worry about people complaining about these birds that flew around your tower and wound up killing themselves somehow. Towers are extremely expensive, too. Very expensive. Uh, golden standard, when I got into this stuff, was a half-watt amp plus an 8 dBi Omni Vertical. Uh, this assumes one dB of loss in the coax uh, and connectors and all the rest of that wonderful fun stuff. Reality, the figure may be lower. It may be a little higher. Um, it's just kind of assumed, and you just hope an FCC agent doesn't show up and want to find out for sure. Okay. <coughs> the FCC maximum uh, effective radiated power is 36 dBm for point-to-multipoint. Uh, transmitter, and when using point-to-point, -point, the maximum is 44 dBm EIRP, which I believe is somewhere around 50 watts or so, maybe actually higher than that. Um, but the transmitter power must be lowered by 1 dB per 3 dB gain over 6 dBi, which realistically speaking isn't a problem until you start dealing with dishes about 6 feet or bigger. Uh, then you start having to, to cut figures out. The dishes they used at... Uh, at the Wi-Fi shootout uh, at 125 miles, uh, they were not derating for power. Uh, I think I remember doing the, the math once, and this works out to something along the lines of uh, if you're using a 32-milliwatt Orinoco card, you actually have to put attenuation between it and the antenna in order to, to maintain compliance when using a 12-foot dish. Why so complicated? Well, because it's an unlicensed band, the FCC has their own rules, and they only want you to, you know, pass go on the second Thursday of every month. There's also satellites up at 2.4 gigahertz. Um, years ago, it was found out that uh, some pretty nifty, innovative ideas they were using. Uh, you put the dish at the bottom of the tower. You put a plane reflector up top. 
it works really well. You have this simple object up top that usually doesn't care about what it's doing, and if you need to fix anything, it's all right there on the ground level until they found out that uh, they were getting TV and, and uh, communication satellites and said, we'll have to change that. Uh, most, of the ante- most of the satellites uh, at 2.4 gigahertz that I'm aware of are ham satellites, so usually you don't have to worry too much about that. <coughs> How much gain does that dish have? Suppose that you just were driving down the road and saw a dish, and you said, that'd be neat. Maybe I want to take it home with me. Uh, You can actually use these figures to figure out more or less if the illumination is perfect, or not perfect, but reasonable, how much gain it would have. Uh, Let's see. What did I use here? Four-foot dish. Winds up working out to 27 dBi, which isn't too bad. It's only about, what, uh, 4 dBi, 4.4 or so higher than the conifer, but the conifer is a, it's a parabolic. It's not perfectly circular. So you, you can see where there's gains here, but generally speaking, circular dishes are very easy to find because most of the land-based microwave stuff use it already. The higher the frequency, the better condition the dish has to be in, the more perfectly round it has to be. Um, most of the ones that were used for uh, terrestrial microwave links operate such high frequencies at 2.4 gigahertz. They're just they're great. <coughs> But uh, that's something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Okay, beam width. Beam width, antenna beam width is always expressed in 3 dB points, uh, which is basically the point where the power measures about half of what you're, you're actually trying to send out the middle. Uh, 99.9% of all antennas are, are calculated this way. In this particular instance, uh, of course, it, it chopped off the, uh, the figure which is uh, 62,580 divided by uh, the diameter in feet times the frequency in megahertz, which, of course, is in the parenthesis, is your bandwidth. So 4 feet, 2483 megahertz, is about 6.3 degrees. So you know that in order to maintain at least half signal strength, you have to be within that that 6-degree window. But, you know, it's much more fun just to throw weird numbers in and see exactly what your numbers come out with. So I said, let's figure out what this would be for a 24-foot dish. And at 2.4 gigahertz, it's one degree. Um, you know, one degree, of course, is half a, is a, is a, three, a 360th of uh, a full circle. So you can pretty well imagine what it's going to take to keep an antenna that has one degree worth of, 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 of total you know, signal area effective in that spot knowing that you have to actually keep it better than one degree. We've got another point here, which is the 24-foot dish is also going to have a huge wind load, and it has to be kept in place. Um, The military and other organizations like to use really fancy, expensive antenna positioning equipment that works extremely well, but it, it costs a boatload of money. But it does the job. Uh, AT&T went the cheaper way out, and they just said, we're going to build a really big, strong, sturdy structure and hope for the best. <coughs> of course, being an infrastructure geek, found out some of the information about the AT&T microwave stuff was online, pulled off lots of interesting facts. Um, the AT&T microwave dishes, the original cornucopias, which that tower out there does not have on it, uh, exhibit 39.6 dB of gain at 4 gigahertz, 43.2 at 6, and 48 dB at 11 gigahertz. Now, 23 dB dish is usually about the most I think anybody in, in this kind of uh, arena is working with, uh, but this gives you an idea of exactly how much antenna gain they're working with. That's absolutely a phenomenal amount of gain, uh, but it's also a very big antenna. You know, I, I wish that there were other bands that you could get this kind of directivity, but really it's unnecessary unless you you really want to, you know, clock people or something You do using radar 200 miles. I don't know. But uh, the beam width winds up getting significantly smaller, 2 degrees and then 1 degree, and then finally 0.8 degrees at 11 gigahertz. The higher the frequency, more gain, the same antenna space, uh, but things get a lot more directional. At less than a degree, that really has to be kept in place extremely well uh, because anything, an earthquake, could potentially knock the link out. Another fact I threw on here was is that I found out the AT&T cornucopia antenna 
has a wind profile of 67 square feet, which is extremely large. Most of the, most of the small antennas, 23 dB on a dish or so, you're going to be winding up with, you know, 2.3 or so square feet, maybe less. So you can see why, why they had to have such big towers. Pretty picture of what I'm talking about, mounted, nice big antenna. It doesn't really show the scale. Um, <clears throat> another another uh, lesson learned with AT&T was channel reuse strategy, which is very important anytime you're doing wireless ISP. You have to you have to engineer the system so that you can reuse as much spectrum as possible without uh, winding up, you know, interfering with another another node or cell and effectively knocking your bandwidth down because of interference. So what AT&T did here, since all their shots are point to point, was is that no path shoots into another path because all the towers are misaligned with each other, so that it's not possible to shoot into another tower. Period. They intentionally offset everything for this reason. Of course, they also used clear Fresnel zones, highly directional antennas, securely mounted. And the original AT&T microwave stuff, they were transmitting less than 5 watts, but they also had a lot of antenna gain behind it. This is another pretty picture I pulled, which looks even worse. Uh, but you can see here we've got one tower here, another tower here, and they just basically did this. They would zigzag the entire path if they needed to in order to, to be able to reuse their channels. And the same lesson applies. You only really have three non-overlapping channels at, at 802.11b. And if you're trying to get from you know here to Knoxville or here to Huntsville or something like that, you have to have a strategy for, for being able to, to make things work. <coughs> distance, realistic limits, and distance really is your largest limiting factor. Um, well. Not exactly. In 802.11b and G, it's actually the protocol itself. Uh, the assumption was is who the heck is going to use this stuff to talk more than 20 miles. So they have some timing variables in there, which are, of course, uh, wired into the protocol itself. You cannot adjust them. So the best you can hope for is to actually slip out of this time window and fall into the one behind it. Because of this, most links over you know, 40 miles or so exhibit significant packet loss. If not packet loss, then definitely throughput. Uh, this is uh, the wall. That, okay, it got chopped off. Uh, even the Wi-Fi shootout at 55.1 miles and 32 milliwatts is only su able to sustain a little less than 150 kilobits per second due to time errors. At that particular time they did it, the link speed was set to 1 megabit per second, not 11. Um, the last link they did, they did set the link speed at 11 megabits, and uh, they were able to pass traffic, but I don't remember the exact figures they used, but it was somewhere around the same ballpark. Um, they wound up slipping out of the second uh, time window into, I think, the third or fourth, and uh, they were taking a significant hit in, in terms of bandwidth. But let's be honest, 125 miles, who cares about the bandwidth? It's just that you said you did it. Uh, radio bandwidth is half duplex. This, is, this has been a hard figure for, for a long time. They originally saw it in packet radio. 11 megabits is great. It's wonderful, but it's like being on a hub. Uh, effectively, you can only hope for half that at best. And of course, they decide to advertise the things at their at their signaling rate, not the actual payload rate, which may be less. Uh, in practice, four and a half to 5.5 megabits is really great. Another problem I've become aware of is is that a lot of a lot of smaller implementations just using commodity hardware, the commodity hardware, particularly regular access points, do not. Uh, have any form of, of a specialization like some of the uh, the alternative methods that have been put out there, like CarlNet. What CarlNet does is they block it and they only move big frames. If you've got a lot of DNS queries or whatever, it'll hold things for a bit and then it'll push them out. With uh, <coughs> with standard 802.11b, you wind up with that stuff immediately getting out over the air. It's not very efficient use of, of your air bandwidth, and you wind up with all your... There's a significant delay between transmit and receive. And you wind up with so much delay built in between uh, all the packets that your bandwidth just disappears. So, weird stuff. Um, I kind of ran out of stuff at this point because it's like, how, how many in, neat and interesting things can you come up with? And apparently I'm not all that inventive. Um, the typical passive uh, detection range is about three times that needed to pass information bidirectionally. So, 
if you've got a link that's working reliably at a mile, it may be possible to actually pick that thing up at three miles out, assuming all you want to do is listen. Um, of course, the federales use this sort of technology, CIA, NSA, all the rest of that stuff. There's monitoring posts all over the country, you know, black helicopters, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's an important thing to, to keep in, in, in mind. Um, you can use a reasonably high-gain uh, dish and confine your signal reception area to an extremely small area, say the access point located at the local police department. Um, Kismet, of course, doesn't transmit any packets. You can also use some of the other tools. I, I forget the exact names that you can, you can find vendors out there will sell you basically a Windows version of Kismet. Uh, and, you know, the, the, side, the downside to this is, is that a high-gain high dish, first of all, who's going to notice a mis-aimed, a, mis-aimed ante- or a mis-aimed satellite dish? Not too many folks. If, if you're astute to radio and you happen to see this thing over here, you might, you might think about it. But the big problem is, is that the higher gain antenna you have, the more noticeable it becomes. And obviously, if you have a satellite dish that's painted camo colors, somebody might kind of wonder. Um, it, often, the, the, the simplest way to cover this up would simply just be to, to be out there. I would not recommend attempting to break into any police department's wireless access, a uh, wireless network, period. I have I have not done any of this passive reception stuff, so don't ask me any questions. Um, I'm I'm serious actually. I I really don't like getting in trouble with the government. <laughs> well, okay. Another interesting point about this, which of course got cut off, is is that suppose we inject a couple of dissociation frames. You know, there are DOS attacks that, that use this method. They go throw packets in the mix. Uh, particularly if you're trying to crack web. And when somebody dissociates, the first thing they're going to do is try and reassociate. And darn it, those IP fields are so predictable. They're always there. They're in a known pattern. You build a list of, of ciphertext, and then you, you, know, you do your processing, and the next thing you know, you've got your web key. So this can be really useful if you just wanted to you know, throw packets out there, cause their, their users to get kicked off, whatever. You could... So you could possibly pick up quite a bit of information. Uh, yeah, that's pretty well close to most of it. I've got some other slides up here that are just kind of goofy stuff. But, uh, of course, the decimals, uh, decibels. Decibels is a really funny way of expressing all this stuff, uh, power relationships and whatnot. Mostly when you're talking about this stuff, it's it's... It's decibels relative to a standard. Uh, DBM is decibels relative to one milliwatt. Uh, 3 dB would be two milliwatts, but the catch is 3 dB is double your power, but 6 dB is times five. So realistically, the only things I keep in my head are 3, 6, and 10, since if you know that it's really close to one of those, you can work it out mathematically very simply without having to have a calculator. Uh, of course, 10 dB is, is 10 times, and 20 dB, you want, for, every, for every 10 dB, it winds up being an order of magnitude. Yeah? Uh, Yeah, the, the question here is is whether or not uh, the atmospheric effects uh, uh, 2.4 gigahertz is also known as the water line, which is where uh, water absorbs radiation, uh, and whether or not uh, water absorption can affect RF. That is a factor. Um, usually, if you're working with a 30 uh, dB fade margin, there's enough built into that margin that unless you happen to live in, in the Pacific Northwest or something where you know, your humidity is rain, then uh, you're probably not going to have to worry about it too much. Um, is that pretty well answer the question? Decode. Yeah. Decode makes a, a valid point here, which is, is that the other thing to remember is is that anything that affects your signal will also affect the noise. If uh, at the at the water lines, because you have uh, water absorbing RF, 
it's going to take your noise sources out too, which for his example is uh, that, uh, you know, he's able to pick up more in, in the rain when he's out war driving. Um, of course, I don't do anything in the rain while I'm driving, so. Right, the, the assumption is more, more noise from, from a distance, as the gentleman pointed out. Um, there's lots of noise sources at 2.4 gigahertz and virtually anything. If you try to use your Wi-Fi card close enough to the microwave, it's possible that you could actually fall off the AP. <coughs> of course, I went out and found some pictures of the, the cornucopia horns because I'm, I really, really dig this stuff. It's, you know, it's, it's a huge piece of structural steel and, and lattice and all the rest of that stuff. And what you can't really see too well is this guy who's only about half as tall as the antenna. So... Here's another shot. We got a guy right down here. The antenna stops right about here, so you can see it's almost three times as tall as this guy. Um, and the uh, the other one here I've got is is that this is actually doesn't show up very well. This is actually AT&T's portable rig they use for setting up the stuff. They threw a 300 foot tower that was sectionalized every two or four feet uh, into a trailer, drove around, said, "Hey, can we set up here and test this stuff out?" The dishes they actually used were mounted on rollers. They could roll them all the way up to 300 feet if need be. Extremely expensive to put together, build, tear down. But they didn't have all this, this math figured out. They were kind of armchairing it. Uh, these are the standard figures for availability. can be used for the lengths, which is uh, you know, 99.999 is, is five minutes worth of yearly downtime. That's not a whole lot, assuming you don't wind up with planes flying over. Um, you do want to to make sure that you don't have your, your fade margins uh, too good because a uh, figure that I got a couple years ago was is that the no damage threshold on an Orinoco is negative 50 dBm. So you can very easily see that if you exceed that, it's possible that your radio card will become deaf. And when it becomes deaf, it's just as bad as throwing more attenuation in there. You may as well just pull the card out and throw it in the trash or hand it to somebody who's interested in Wi-Fi, but you really don't want causing too much of a problem. And, of course, you can, well, yeah, here's the only two figures. The next one down is the three nines, which is five minutes. And the next nine uh, at uh, six nines, I think, is what it is, is 30 seconds. Can you manage 30 seconds worth of downtime a year? Uh, the AT&T, uh, or the Lucent uh, 5ESS in the field achieves six nines. Uh, in the lab, they only rated it for five. And that's the rest of the stuff. Any questions? Uh, he was he was wanting to know the infrastructure details and, and how the stuff was set up. Um, the, the city that I did the stuff in was uh, was Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, we had. Uh, an existing competitor in the market and uh, really weren't exactly aware of it. And somehow, quite by chance, we ended up using the exact same radios, the uh, hardware that uh, they were using, uh, which, which used uh, 802.11b carts uh, stuck into a very small PC running a lot of assembly. And uh, somehow we wound up on top of a tall building like this one and actually went microcellular in the... Uh, in the business district, because we were closer, we were able to actually get better coverage than the uh, other fellows who were located up on a uh, TV tower up the hill. So it was it was a, smer uh, a fairly small network. Uh, like I said, we had we had at least one node there in town, and uh, we had our backhaul, which was always reliable. Uh, it was we had two 23 dBi dishes, uh, and I think uh, what was it about a two mile shot or something, uh, you know torrential rains and it was doing fine so uh, we did we did run into a few issues out in the field which was uh, if you have a height adjustment you really need to really need to judge and find out exactly what sort of tilt is going to be required of your antennas because if you're you know stuck in steps where you're zero and then 15 and so on and the antenna has less vertical beam width than that particularly if you're well not necessarily vertical beam width but beam with and, and the direction that you're interested in. You want to make sure that uh, you don't wind up shooting into the building instead of up on the building where the antenna's at. Uh, otherwise the link can, can you know, fall down and won't be nearly as reliable. 
And your customer will be on the phone saying, hey, um, our, our network just isn't quite working out here. But yeah, I think that's most of that. So any other questions? Oh, look. I actually made it for, I guess, about an hour here, so only about five minutes late. But it's not my fault, I swear. Uh, any questions about anything to do with uh, radio, microwave, anything like that? All right, cool beans. Thanks for having me.